but also for your own personal life that you can see God's hand every day doing great things and giving him the glory for the things that he's doing in you and through you. This morning we're going to be observing the Lord's table at the end or the conclusion portion of our service. So we've abbreviated the beginning portion of the service a little bit and I will attempt to abbreviate my sermon a little bit as well so that we can enjoy our time together at the Lord's table thinking about what Christ has done for us on Calvary's cross. So I invite you to take a Bible, one you have there in your lap or perhaps one there in front of you in the pew rack and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 29 this morning. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I've entitled my, my message, The Big Question. And maybe for differing, different people that means something different or maybe there's something different that pops into your mind when you hear that phrase, the big question. Perhaps you think back to that day when you got down on one knee and your stomach was in your throat wondering if she would say yes as you popped that big question of, will you marry me? Or maybe you were on the receiving end of that, right? And all of a sudden, he's down on one knee. What in the world is he doing? And he says, will you marry me? And hopefully you said yes. Well, if you're here today as a married couple, I assume somewhere along the line you said yes to that, right? And that was the big question. Maybe you think of other big questions, like I can remember when our kids were young and we were not anticipating it or expecting it, and out of the blue, one of them says, where do babies come from? Like I was ready to answer that big question at that very moment. Usually those types of questions come at rather inopportune times where we're really not prepared for those big questions. Or maybe when you think about big questions, maybe you think about some of the philosophical questions of life in terms of why am I here? What is the purpose of life? How did we all get here? What's after life? And of course, all those big philosophical questions are questions that are answered in the Bible. I'm very thankful that those questions are answered in Scripture. Well, this morning we're going to look at a big question that's not anything like any of those big questions, but it is a big question that is posed by David to the, to the nation of Israel, and it's recorded for us in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 in the latter portion of verse 5. If you'll look at that with me, in the second portion of 1 Chronicles 29 verse 5, David says this. Now remember, David is... is older and he's finished his ministry as the king of Israel has almost completed that and so in the latter moments of life at the, in the sunset hours of his life and his ministry as the king he says to the nation who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord that's a big question he says to the nation of Israel, who then is willing to consecrate himself to, to God Almighty? It's interesting, the very phrase there that David uses is really packed with principles and with truth. When he uses this phrase, consecrate, literally it means to, to fill one's hand. He's saying, who is willing to, to kind of put their, their life in their, in their hand and then reach that hand up to God and say, I'm yours. I'm willing to consecrate. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to, to give myself to you, Lord. The word consecrate there was actually a word that was used in reference to the biblical, Old Testament biblical concept of the priesthood. And someone being ordained to be a priest because that was a that was a calling so to speak and so they would give themselves again it's this fill your hand with they would give themselves to god to serve through the the priesthood and the ministry of the tabernacle and the temple and yet he's not using the term in, in those in that sense for just a few that would be priests no he's using it for the entire nation and it's really kind of a precursor to what we see in the New Testament of Romans 12, 1 and 2, of where the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And so David says, who is willing to consecrate themselves today to the Lord? One writer puts it this way in describing this term, consecrate. He says, quote, this was a technical phrase used to describe ordination to the priesthood. And Scripture significantly places the act of giving on this same level of devotion, end quote. 
So giving to God is like being ordained to the priesthood of the Old Testament. Giving is, is, a, is a sacred, is as sacred as becoming an Old Testament priest. So when it comes to giving, when it comes to generosity, the big question really isn't. The big question isn't how much will you give? That's not the question. The big question is, will you give yourself? Because that's what God wants. And after all, the most that you can give to God is yourself. Who will consecrate himself to the Lord God today is what David asked. And what we have to also ask ourselves, it's the question that God would ask all of us at really every day of our lives. Who is willing to give themselves to God? That's the big question. And so God wants us to consecrate. He wants us to, to give ourselves to him. And so this morning, I want us to look at four ideas then in connection with that concept of giving ourselves to God. And, and in order for us to do that, we have to understand the context of First Chronicles chapter 29. The context is that it's 500 years after what we studied last week. Last week, we were focused on the tabernacle and the appeal that was made for the building of the tabernacle and the nation of Israel being asked to give to that special project for the worship of Jehovah. Well, now it's 500 years later. And Israel is now in the land. They have possessed the promised land. And under David's rulership, they also have, have enjoyed some peace near the end of his, of his kingdom. And so it, it's at that time in his life when Israel is in the land and they're enjoying peace. And David, of course, a man after God's own heart, had this heart to build the temple. But you know the account I trust that God told him, no, you're not the man to do this. My plan is for your son to build the temple. And so David wanted to make all the provision he possibly could for Solomon, his son, who would become the next king to be able to build the temple. And it's in that context then that he comes to the nation of Israel and says these words that are now recorded for us in Scripture. So if you'll back up with me to First Chronicles 29, let's look at the rest of the text. Beginning in verse 1, First Chronicles 29, the Bible says, Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom God alone, or whom, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God, I've prepared with all my might gold for the things to be made of gold, silver for the things of silver, bronze for the things of bronze, iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, onyx stones, Stones set to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, and marble slabs in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of, of gold and silver, 3,000 talents of gold and gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses, the gold up for things of gold and silver for things of silver and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. And then he asks our all-important question that we've already noted this morning. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? And so notice with me this morning four different ideas here in relationship to us consecrating ourselves and giving ourselves to God. The first, the first idea is that of the task. And that task is described for us there in, in verse 1, where David says, My son is young, and the work is great, and because the temple is not for man, but it's for the Lord God. Notice two ideas in connection with the task. First of all, the project. The, the work is great, he says, because, because it's the temple. It's interesting, that word temple literally means palace. As a matter of fact, it would be used to describe palaces such as the palaces of, of Persian kings in the eras of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so some have suggested that it could even be translated like this, that, that the task is great because of this palatial structure. We're not building something modest. We're not building something small. We're building something, after all, for the Lord. And of course, if you've ever studied the construction of the temple, you know how ornate and beautiful and how much gold there was, as is inferred by even what we've read here this morning, that this was to be the palace for the Lord, after all. And so the, the project is significant. But then notice, secondly, not just the project, but the purpose. 
And he delineates that for us in the second part of verse 1 when he specifically says, it's not for man. It's for the Lord God. Can, can you imagine attempting to build a, an earthly structure that is fitting for God? Really, that's not possible. I mean, God's true temple is in heaven that alone can, can, if you can use these terms that are physical for the spiritual, that can alone be the residence of God. We all know in reality, God also resides throughout the universe. He's present everywhere. But this palace was to be a place, this temple was to be a place of, of worship, a place of sacrifice, a place where his glory was, was seen. And so it was to be for him and for him alone. As a result of that, David did not take this task lightly to make a temple for the Lord. And as I noted last week in relationship to the Greater Things Ministry, we're, we're not building a temple or a tabernacle. The New Testament church is not a temple. It's not a tabernacle in any way, shape, or form other than the New Testament concept of the fact that your body is the temple. The Bible says that. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But what we hope to do through the Greater Things is to address a physical plant so to speak and the financial needs of the church in terms of renovation and and some of those other types of things paying off debt but but ultimately it, it has the same purpose as what you have depicted here it's not for us it's for the lord and so that makes it worth being a part of because of our desire like david's desire to do this not for us but for the lord and so the task notice and secondly not just the task but also notice the the team because David, in his wisdom, at the latter end of his life, he, he understood the significance of not trying to tackle this alone and the importance of, of not even just trying to attempt it just himself with his leadership, but with the entire nation participating in the offerings that would then be given to make the temple possible. Notice the team. First of all, you see the king himself depicted for us in verses 2 through 5 as David makes his commitment. And you, you notice his example. We won't walk through all the quantities of all the things that David gives here like we did last week in terms of the wealth of it other than to say it was significant and it was significantly larger than that which was given for the tabernacle because this was to be a permanent structure. You remember last week? The tabernacle was beautiful and ornate, but it was still a tent. And this is to be a, a, a permanent structure. And so David sets the example as the king by giving very generously. And I think in verse 2 we have displayed for us his personal resources. Or excuse me, in verse 2 we have his, the national resources. And then in verse 3 his personal resources and his personal sacrifice. But I want you to notice specifically what it says there in verse 3 about David's heart that was behind it. Because that's so important. Verse 3 it says, Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God. He says, the reason behind my giving and the reason behind my, my sacrifices, it's all about my heart. It's all about my love for God and, and love for what, what we want to do for him. And so that ought to be our heart as well. A heart of sacrifice is a heart that has set its affection on the house of God and on the things of God. You've heard us say already over the course of the last few months that sacrifice is truly giving up something you love for someone you love more. And David here exemplifies that principle. It's the principle that's not just taught in the Old Testament. It's taught throughout the New Testament as well. It's what Jesus was referring to when he said in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, don't lay up treasures for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up treasures in heaven for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you treasure will determine what you love and where you place your priorities it's what paul referred to in colossians 3 1 through 3 when we're commanded to set your mind on things above and not on things on earth you see giving is an expose of a heart giving or perhaps the lack of giving is an expose of a person's heart and so David set an example, but then only after he set an example could he then go to 
his leadership. So note not only the king, but also notice the leadership of the, of the nation. He, he exhorts them to, to give, as we pointed out in verse 5, but then he goes to the leaders of the nation, and he says, I, I'd like you to join me in this. Look at it, what it says there, verse 6. Then the leaders of the fathers' houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly... So he set the example, and he exhorted them to do the same, but then the leadership stepped forward and said, you know what, we would like to give as well. And as I noted last week, the term offering is used here. It was also used in our, in our text last week in reference to the tabernacle. The, the principle of an offering is that which is over and above a tithe. The starting place for the child of God for giving is 10% of their income to the work of the Lord. That's throughout the Bible. But, but on top of that, an offering is an expression of love, sometimes during special occasions where we choose to give an offering more than the, the tithe, more than that starting point, because we sense God wanting us to. And so what did they do? They gave an offering. And it's described for us there in those verses in terms of the leadership and how they, they gave willingly and how they gave generously. Look at how it states it there. The end of verse 6, they offered willingly. Verse 7, they gave for the work of the house of God. And then it gives the specifics of that. In verse 9, then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly. Again, these are all principles that you find all over the Bible. We noted them last week. The importance of, of being a willing giver, the importance of being a joyful giver. And so, so the, the leaders gave, and they gave willingly and generously. And as I said last week, in reference to the greater things, and really to all giving if you cannot give willingly do not give if you can't if you don't sense god is leading you to do this and prompting you to do this then don't give god loves a cheerful giver that principles all over scripture so we see the leaders and then finally we also then see the people in verse 9, we have described for us what it, what it says in reference to the people. When it says, Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart, there's that heart issue again, they had offered willingly, there it is again, to the Lord, and King David also rejoiced greatly. You see, the people followed suit. David set the example, the leaders followed his example, and then the nation of Israel followed the example of both David and the leadership and they all gave willingly and joyfully and as a result god's work was accomplished not just by a few god's work was accomplished by all all of those who participated and that's so important for us to understand because that principle ought to be true of us as a church as well that everybody would so to speak get on the team it's interesting how many different little snapshot memories i have of of my childhood and growing up days isn't it amazing how much you've forgotten i mean think about the few things you really remember with with in a vivid manner one of the most vivid rem memories i have when i was probably like 13 was going to a bible camp in uh, central nebraska for a uh, a work retreat in other words our church went down and they kind of had, had taken ownership for this Bible camp that, that the organization of churches owned. And uh, so we went down there to help work and just do some things around the camp. Well, they were in the midst of, of about to, being about to build a building. And so they were going to have a groundbreaking ceremony. Now, I had seen other groundbreaking ceremonies or pictures of other groundbreaking ceremonies, and it's usually guys all dressed up in suits and ties, and some guy has like this gold-painted shovel. You, you've seen those kinds of pictures, right? Or else maybe three or four important people have, you know, shovels or one of them standing on the shovel, that kind of routine. That's what I, that's what I think of when I think of a groundbreaking ceremony. Well, they didn't do that. And, and I don't think it was just because it was Nebraska and we're all hicks, okay? Uh, they did something a little more farmer-oriented, though. The camp director or the chairman of the board, I don't know who the guy was, the important guy that did the speaking, okay? I was just 13 or so. Uh, he got up and he said, you know, the only way this is going to be accomplished is if everybody pitches in, is if everybody does their part. So we're not just going to have one person dig a ceremonial, one shovel full of dirt and have a groundbreaking. Instead, I want to do something different. And so he had set up there on the grounds of the camp, he had this one bottom plow, you know, the old kind with the handles that would normally be carried or pulled by a team or two teams of horses, 
he had that sitting there and he had this great big long tug of war type of rope you know the great big ropes and he says this is how we're going to do this groundbreaking ceremony he said i'd like everybody to get on the rope now i had used actually one of those my dad had still had one of those that we would use to pull behind the old 1948 john deere b b to dig our potatoes okay that was a really nice way to dig potatoes because they all came out of the ground at once and Dad liked to grow potatoes by the acre, it seemed, as a kid, so I sure liked that better than a potato fork. But I had not never seen people pull it, okay? And so he had everybody get on the rope and everybody get, grab a hold, and I don't know if it was the count of three or what it was, but he gave some kind of signal, and I was absolutely amazed how easy it was to make a furrow through the sod and to dig up all that ground just by, a, I don't know, 100 people, maybe, maybe there were a few more than that people, all hanging on the rope, all pulling in the same direction, all headed to a mutual goal, and all having a part in the team. As a matter of fact, I remember thinking, wow, this is easy. I'm not hardly pulling anything. And the reason I didn't have to hardly pull anything is because everybody was pulling some. And that's the principle here that I think Scripture is teaching us in relationship to, to God doing greater things, and even in relationship to what God wants to do in and through First Baptist Church. It's not about just the pastor. It's not about the pastor and the deacons and the Sunday school teachers. It's about everybody doing their part. Whatever that may be, no matter how small or how big, doesn't matter. Everybody doing their part and pulling in the same direction and watching God supply and watching God then do greater things. So the task is great, but when everybody does their part, it makes all the difference. And so the team is important. Notice then, thirdly, as a result of that, what David does we have it depicted for us there in verses 9 through 16, the ending part of verse 9, because then notice thirdly, the tribute. David is very careful not to praise man. He's very careful to praise God. And verse 9 gives you a little bit of an allusion to it at the end of the verse when it says, and King David also rejoiced greatly. Everybody was going to have a part in this. But it wasn't about the everybody. It was about the God who worked in the hearts of everybody. And so notice what he says in verses 10 through 16. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the, the assembly. And, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and earth is, is yours. Yours is the kingdom of Lord. And you are exalted as, he as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. And your hand is power, or in your hand is power and might. In your hand is to make great and to give us strength to all. Now therefore, or, or our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I? But who am I? Who are my people? that we should be able to, to offer so willingly as this. For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as, we, as were all our fathers, our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand, and all is your own. Notice two things in relationship to this tribute of joy that David expresses as a demonstration of his worship back to God. First of all, notice that he recognized God's ownership. Over and over and over again in those verses, you see him saying, it's yours, it all belongs to you, God. Psalm 24, 1 puts it this way, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. You see the very foundational principle of biblical stewardship is always it all belongs to god it's not mine none of this is ours your house isn't yours your car isn't yours your job isn't yours your ability to even work isn't yours it's all from god deuteronomy 8 makes it clear just the very ability to even have a job or do something that's productive it's all from god so god owns it all and if we don't get that foundationally and fundamentally we'll never understand stewardship because stewardship is more than giving stewardship is management 
very idea of management is that God owns it and he deposits it to me. He says, now you manage my resources and someday you'll give an account. That's the parable of the talents that Jesus taught. That's the parable of the pounds that Jesus taught that we had depicted for us in a drama last week. We're just managers of God's resources. Randy Alcorn in his book, The Treasure Principle, makes a really pointed question in relationship to that when he says this. He says, do you live like God is the CEO or the owner, so to speak, of your life and all the stuff you have? Or do you live like he's merely your financial consultant to whom you pay a fee? You see, I think some people think, well, as long as I tithe, everything else is mine. God gets his 10%, I get 90%. Woohoo, right? No, that's not the biblical idea of stewardship. God owns 100%, and he's not just this consultant I give 10% to. I manage everything that, that he has given to me, but it's really his. David understood that. He recognized God's ownership. William Howe understood that. William Howe was the Bishop of Bedford in the mid-19th century. And he understood it when he wrote the hymn, We Give Thee But Thine Own. You see, Howe was burdened for the street children of London. And he was concerned that it seemed that a lot of Christians who had all of their needs met seemed a little indifferent to the, to the needs of the kids that lived on the streets. And in that context, he wrote this song, We Give Thee But Thine Own own to challenge Christians to give, especially when those gifts could minister to the needs of those who had so much less. The words go like this, we give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounties thus as stewards true receive, and gladly as thou blesses us, to thee our first fruits give you see he understood that god owned it all hanging on to what god wants us to give back to him hanging on to what god wants us to give back to him contradicts this foundational principle of stewardship god owns it all and really it's ridiculous to think that we would say to god mine (laughs) because that's what we do in essence when we refuse to give it's like no it's mine No, it's not. It's his. We just have it for a while to steward. And so he recognized God's ownership, and then secondly, he recognized his own unworthiness. And that's the spirit of humility that ought to permeate the heart of a giver. Look at how he states it there, verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able even so willingly to give? For all things come from you and, and, and of, of your own we have given you. In other words, we're just giving back you, to you what you've already given to us. And then he, in verse 15 says, we're just foreigners. We're just travelers. We're, we're pilgrims. We're people just coming through. And again, you see that all over Scripture that we're just temporary residents on this planet because our permanent residence is where? It's in heaven. We're citizens of heaven, and so what, ma- what ma- makes a, uh, what is a priority, it ought to be a priority in our lives, is those things that are eternal, making a difference. He says, I'm not worthy. I, and I, when I thought of this, I, I couldn't help but think of, if you had a small child, and Christmas was coming, and the child had no resources whatsoever to give you anything, and so in a, moment of sweet humility they got this really good idea and this little three-year-old or four-year-old went went to your stuff in your closet or wherever you keep it something that was really important to you and, and they got it out and without you knowing they wrapped it up in this nice gift as nicely as a three or four-year-old could wrap it up and they put it underneath the tree and on Christmas Day, they brought it out, and they were, say, they were so happy. Here, Daddy, or here, Mommy, and they gave it to you, and you unwrapped it, and inside that box is something you already owned. Let me ask you, how would you respond if, if they did that? You'd be thrilled, wouldn't you? I mean, that big smile on their face and those big eyes that are sparkling because they want to make you happy by giving you something for Christmas, Right? 
it would be totally irrelevant that it was yours to start with. As a matter of fact, it would be more precious to you in all likelihood than if they'd given you the, the most expensive thing at the top of your Christmas wish list. Why? Because they gave it back to you out of a heart of love for you. And that's really what we do every time we give back to God. We're just giving him what was already his. And he doesn't sit back and say, huh, I already owned it. No, he smiles and is thrilled to know that his little child wants to express adoration and worship by giving back to him that which he already owned. That's what David is saying here. God already owns it. And so humility, I'm amazed that he lets me give it. That he lets me give it back. You see, the humble-hearted are always generous-hearted. That's what David exemplified here. A humble heart that was then a generous heart. So he gives God all the glory. He recognizes God's ownership. And he recognizes his unworthiness. May that be the spirit with which we give all of our lives and our very hearts to the Lord. So we've noted the task, the team, the tribute, and then finally notice the test. Notice what David concludes with in verses 17 through 20. Begin reading with me in verse 17. He says this, I know also, my God, that you test the heart. You test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me and the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now with joy I have seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to, to you. He, he's saying, I'm just so thrilled that not only did I give with a, with a heart of love, but, but my people, your people, are giving with that same kind of heart, a heart that you've tested. And then he says this in verses 18 and 19. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart toward you. He's saying, let's not ever get over this moment, Lord. When we offered lovingly, when we offered willingly, when we gave because you've given, let's not get over that. And then he goes on and he says, and give my son, verse 19, Solomon, a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes to do all these things and to build the temple for which I've made provision Verse 20, then David said to all the assembly, now bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed their heads and prostrated themselves before the Lord and the king. The test. You see, God tests our hearts through giving. We give, we give to, and we spend money on what we love. Just the reality of life. So giving is one of the toughest spiritual tests for many Christians to pass. And it's, it's never a test that you, you pass it once and you're done. It's like the final, of the final exam for that course you take. It's really something that God is doing in our hearts and our lives, all of our lives, because we're all a part of this thing called progressive sanctification where we're becoming more like Christ and less like our sinful, selfish selves. And so God is developing this progressive sanctification in us and giving us tests all along the way. Tests that can be difficult for us to pass. But important for us to pass. Because after all, David's prayer here was for the heart of his people. Did you notice that in verses 18 and 19? His prayer was for the heart of his people. He says, you test the heart and you have pleasure and uprightness. And as for me and the uprightness of my heart, I've willingly offered. He says, God, you know my heart. You know the heart of my people. And Lord, that's what we want is, is that kind of heart. You see, our biggest prayer for greater things must never be the amount that needs to be raised. That shouldn't be our biggest prayer. That's really insignificant. In light of the principles of Scripture, our biggest prayer prayer must be for God to work in our hearts. Whatever that amount becomes is irrelevant because as long as God has done a work in our hearts and we have responded in relationship to his word and his spirit and we've given ourselves to God, the, the amount is irrelevant. So may we pray for God's work in our hearts because the big question after all is not how much, 
big question is, will you give yourself to God? As I said at the beginning, the most you can give to God is yourself. The most you can give to God is yourself. And so this morning, are you willing to consecrate yourself? To give yourself this day to the Lord? What does that look like? I think it looks like at least three things. Number one, it looks like salvation. In that the way that you initially give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ is by placing your faith in him for salvation and eternal life. And that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. And he took sin's penalty upon himself. We will remember that here in a few minutes in our service. But he, he paid the price. He died for you so that you can have eternal life. You don't have to pay the price yourself. That's what's so ridiculous about people trying to get to heaven by good works is they are trying to pay a price that Christ already paid. And so this morning, do you know for certain that if you were to die that you'd spend eternity in heaven because you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? You've repented of your sins and placed your faith in him. Or do you need to give your life to Jesus Christ today in salvation? Secondly, it looks like this. It looks like surrender. What are you holding back from God? That's a surrender issue. What are you hanging on to and saying, God, it's mine? That God says, no, it's not. None of it's yours. Perhaps you've been hesitant to give up something or someone because it's yours when in reality it's God's. You know what that is, don't you? It's an idol. Anything you're unwilling to give to God is an idol. And so perhaps there's a matter of surrender in your life, and it may have nothing to do with everything else I preached this morning, but you know in your heart there's something that you're hanging on to. Surrender. And then finally, it looks like sacrifice. What are you willing to put in your hand? Remember that word consecrate means that, and give it back to God. Are you, as David said, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? And that's, that's a question I ask you about greater things, specifically in terms of application. Again, amount is irrelevant. Are you willing to say, you know what? God wants me to be a part of it. So I'm going to give myself as an offering back to him. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that all of us would give ourselves to you because you have given to us. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. So I pray today that you'd use the principles of these verses of Scripture to speak to our hearts and that we'd answer that big question in each of our hearts.